welcome friends to this new lecture of uh, soil science and technology and today we will be starting a new topic uh, that is uh, soil tillage and soil density and then we will go ahead with other topics. So, uh, this today's topic we will start with first soil tillage then we will discuss about different types of tillages and uh, you know uh, what are the what is conventional tillage what is uh, um, conservation tillage what are the benefits of conservation tillage and uh, you know soil crusting and so on and so forth so let us start today's topic that is soil tillage and soil density so let us start with so first soil tillage so what you actually you know you know what we actually mean by tillage the term tillage is basically uh, you know is the preparation of soil for planting and the cultivation of soil after the planting. So, you can see in this picture that uh, this is tractor is uh, tilling the soil and uh, you know there are different types of tillages which we will learn in a couple of minutes and uh, so tillage is basically the preparation of soil for planting and it is basically uh, helps in providing a favorable soil physical condition for uh, growth and germination of the plant. So, let us see what is soil tilth. Tilth is basically the physical condition which occurs after the tillage. So, in other words tilth refers to the physical condition of the soil in relation to the plant growth. Now, it basically the tilth of a good tilth of a soil basically depends on aggregate formation and then its uh, stability, uh, then bulk density, then soil moisture content and uh, degree of aeration, rate of water infiltration, drainage and capillary water capacity and all these things. So, tillage is uh, a term which shows basically the preparation of soil to provide a favorable physical condition for plant growth and germination, germination and plant growth whereas, tilth is the physical condition which achieved due to tillage. So, let us see what is the first kind of tillage. Now, first kind of tillage is basically conventional tillage which we generally see, uh, which we generally see uh, uh, in Indian fields and basically in conventional tillage farmers use machines like plow and disc to turn over and loosen the soil after harvest and this can leave the soil exposed to rain and wind and which can sometimes lead to erosion of the topsoil that is needed to grow it uh, you know needed for the growth of the crop. Now, generally in case of conventional tillage we generally use different types of implements or different types of equipments for, for making the soil more loose and or in other words to increase or to, de to decrease the uh, bulk density of the soil. So, that uh, you know the, the favorable physical condition for the growth of the crop is maintained. There is more aeration and more uh, air movement and water movement. So, these are the reason generally farmers go for conventional tillage. However, the conventional tillage has a limitation that it exposes the soil which is, uh, which is subjected to different types of uh, wind and water erosion. So, uh, what are the different types of conventional tillage? Now, the first type of conventional tillage is called primary tillage and primary tillage is the first soil tillage after the last harvest and it is normally conducted when the soil is wet enough to allow plowing and strong enough to give reasonable level of traction. Remember that this type of primary, this primary tillage is basically done after the last harvest and it is normally conducted when the soil is you know wet enough to allow plowing and strong enough to give reasonable level of traction and this can be immediately uh, this can uh, the, you know this primary tillage can occur immediately after the crop harvest or at the beginning of the next crop season. And uh, when there is a sufficient power available, some soil types are ploughed in dry condition also. As you can see here, I have given two pictures where you know uh, the farmers are uh, you know tilling the soil, uh, and this is a this is an example of primary tillage. Remember that primary tillage always done after the harvest of the previous crop or just beginning of the uh, or the beginning of the next wet season. 
So, what are the objectives of primary tillage? The primary tillage objectives are there are four major objectives. First of all, to attain a reasonable depth that is 10 to 15 centimeter, we call it furrow slice of soft soil with varying clot sizes. Now, uh, you know, reasonable depth, you know, to attain a reasonable, you know, we, we, for the germination uh, of a crop and for their proper growth, we need to maintain. Uh, a good soil favorable condition or good soil physical condition up to 0 to 15 centimeter depth because uh, that is uh, you know that is the depth up to which most of the plant roots for most of the field crops grow. So, uh, the first objective is to attain a reasonable depth of soft soil with varying clot size. The second and one of the major objective of primary tillage is to kill the weeds by uh, burying or cutting and exposing the roots. Third one is the soil aeration and water accumulation and finally, to chop and incorporate crop residues. So, these are couple of uh, the, these are couple of objectives for primary tillage and uh, uh, you know there is another type of tillage called secondary tillage. Remember that secondary tillage is any working completed after primary tillage and uh, you know there are a couple of objectives for doing the secondary tillage there are five objectives for doing the secondary tillage one is uh, as you can see here one is reduction of clot size then weed control then incorporation of the fertilizer then pardling and leveling of soil surface now we know that uh, in the primary tillage we reduce the, you know we break down the clots and further in the secondary tillage we try to reduce the clot size. Uh, secondary tillage also helps in weed control. Uh, secondary tillage helps in incorporation of fertilizer. We will discuss that later when we will discuss uh, the fertilizers. Puddling uh, uh, is an important uh, secondary tillage operation for rice crop and also leveling the soil surface because when we are reducing the cloth size this is becoming more smooth. So, you can see in this picture that uh, this is a example this is an example of secondary tillage. Now, now regarding pardling you you know you must have seen this pardling quite a lot time in the uh, rice field because uh, you know we generally do the puddling uh, operation in the rice field in the standing water in the presence of standing water and uh, we are further breaking down the clots due to secondary tillage and uh, one of the major reason of doing the puddling is to make an impervious soil layer and due to the impervious soil layer the water movement or water infiltration into the soil is nullified. So, as a result the water gets you know accumulated at the top of the soil which is required for the growth of the rice crop. So, this is called puddling and this is an example of secondary tillage operation. So, so, you have seen that uh, there are you know there are different types of primary tillage and you know the there are some limitations of primary tillage because uh, because of primary tillage uh, soil become uh, more subjected to irrations and uh, so in recent decades agricultural land management system has been developed that minimizes the need for soil tillage and leaves the soil surface largely covered by plant residues and thereby maintaining several uh, aspects. So, we call this uh, new technique of soil tillage is as conservation tillage. Now, as a result of conservation tillage, you generally we maintain soil biological habitat and we stabilize the soil structure. We maintain first soil biological habitat, then we stabilize the soil structure, then uh, you know we, we can conserve the soil organic matter and finally, physically protecting the soil from dying sun, scoring uh, wind and beating rain. Now, as you know this sec conventional tillage requires minimum soil disturbance, obviously the soil microorganisms and microorganisms can thrive better in the soil 
and stabilizing the soil structure because we are leaving the uh, plant residues not removing the plant residues these decomposed and produces a huge amount of organic matter and as you know from our soil structure lecture that these organic matter are helpful for producing the better soil structure and conserving soil organic matter obviously we are not exposing the soils and uh, since we are not exposing the soil it is not coming in direct uh, contact with the sunlight and as a result there will be no uh, you know there will be reduced decomposition of organic matter and uh, ultimately there will be conservation of organic matter and finally physically protecting the soil from drying sun scoring wind and beating rain obviously these are couple of uh, you know limitations of primary tillage which can be addressed through second uh, you know conventional tillage now according to the us department of agriculture or usda they define conservation tillage as that tillage practice that leaves at least 30% of the soil surface covered by residues so there is an important aspect so, unless you, uh, you know, uh, unless you leave the plant residues into the field after uh, the harvest, you cannot tell, you cannot, you cannot term it as a conventional, as a conservation tillage. So, it is an important aspect of conservation tillage. You, you have to maintain at least 30 percent of the soil surface covered by residues, so that you can conserve both organic matter, you can produce the stabilized soil structure and you can produce the better habitat for soil biological uh, organisms. So, now conservation tillage is basically a technique for planting seed that minimizes the disruption of the soil and therefore helps prevent soil erosion. We have already discussed that in the last slide and remember that farmers use special equipment to plant seeds leaving most of the residues like stalks of the previous crop intact and planting in this way allows the crop residue to break down which adds further organic matter like composting while protecting the soil from erosion. We have already covered that in the last slide. So basically while we are leaving the residues into the field they decompose and further adds organic matter into the soil and also protect the soil structure and uh, you know protect the soil from being eroded. So, these are some advantages of uh, soil uh, conservation tillage. Another important type, important uh, tillage operation for conservation tillage is called no-till and uh, basically in case of no-till, one crop is planted in the residue of another with virtually no tillage. So, this is called no-till condition as you can see in this picture, they are just planting the seeds in the residue of another, so it is virtually no tillage is being done, it is called no-till condition. Another important uh, unfavorable condition for soil is called soil crusting. Now soil crusting generally occurs due to falling you know due to the beating action of falling raindrops. Now you know that falling drops of water during heavy rain or sprinkler irrigation can beat apart aggregates exposed into the soil surface. So if we think this is a soil particle due to the breaking due to the beating action of falling rainfall these uh, aggregates will further break down and it will produce the individual particles and these in once the aggregates become dispersed these small particles and dispersed clay tends to wash into and clog the, the pore space. Once it clogs the soil pores the soil surface is covered with a thin and partially cemented low permeability low permeability layer material called a surface seal now when the surface seal dries it forms a hard crust so that is called soil crusting you can see the soil you know the figure the the picture of soil crusting i have presented here and you must have seen it a couple of times so this is an example of soil crusting and these soil crusts are basically occurred from clogging the pores, soil pores uh, by very small particles like clay particles and thereby restricting the movement of or the restricting the uh, restricting the infiltration of the water into the soil. So, this is an example this is called the soil crusting. So, what are the problems of soil crusting? Why should we bother if there is a soil crusting? Obviously, 
because uh, you know in the, if there is a soil crusting it will inhibit soil water infiltration it will increase the erosion losses and it will inhibit the emergence of the seedlings because the due to the soil crust and in the hard surface the seedling cannot germinate and in especially in arid and semi arid regions soil sealing and crusting can have disastrous consequences because high runoff losses leave little water available to support the plant growth so these are some uh, you know problems which occur due to the uh, the soil crusting now you can see there are three pictures of soil crusting as you obviously you can see that crust layer and uh, finally you can see in the last figure last picture that strug you know the the ceiling is struggling to break up to break a soil crust so this is a problem uh, for soil germination so obviously we should be very careful to avoid any type of soil crusting or if it occurs we must uh, break the soil crust due to using different types of management practices so what are the different managements you can you can you, uh, you know management of soil crusting so uh, for example first keeping some vegetative or mulch cover on the land to reduce the impact of rain rain drops so if you keep some uh, vegetative or mulch mulch is a protective layer uh, which you know over the soil surface so if you can produce a protective layer over the soil surface obviously it will reduce the impact of the beating rain drops and once a crust has formed it may be necessary to rescue a new uh, a newly planted crop by breaking up the crust with light tillage and for light tillage you can use a rotary hoe as you can see in this picture as uh, you know this is an example this is a rotary hoe and this rotary hoe you know breaks the soil crust and preferably when the soil is most still moist and uh, obviously it all the soil casting can also be minimized using different types of soil conditions so what is soil conditioners soil conditioners are you know soil conditioners are basically some uh, chemical agents which you know which we generally add to the soil to improve its physical condition so improve management of soil organic matter and use of certain soil amendments can condition the soil and help prevent clay dispersion and crust formation two important soil conditioners are gypsum and organic polymers so <coughs> why gypsum and gypsum is basically used for collecting the soil physical condition uh, you know collecting the soil physical condition and used in uh, low salinity uh, to sodium rich soil and finally it improves the flocculation of the soil what do you mean by flocculation so if there are individual soil particles or individual clay particles by by adding the gypsum we are basically adding calcium sulfate to h2o and this calcium sulfate will generate calcium cations these calcium cation will help in aggregation of these individual soil particles together to form an aggregate and ultimately it will settle down so this is called flocculation condition this is called flocculation and flocculation occurs due to aggregate formation and this calcium which comes from gypsum basically helps in the flocculation condition and remember that when there is a flocculation obviously the structures are stabilized and the porosity favorable pores will be you know favorable uh, condition will be maintained porosity will be maintained for proper movement of air and water for the growth of the crop so these are important aspects another type of uh, organic conditioners are polyacrylamide or PAM which is basically effective in stabilized surface aggregates when applied as rates as low as 1 to 15 milligram per liter of irrigation water or spread on at rates as low as 1 to 4 kg per hectare so when we apply these organic conditioner these also helps in producing better uh, stabilized soil structure 
and as a result of stabilized soil structure obviously the porosity will be maintained and as a result better air movement and uh, water movement will be ensured. So, these are uh, you know some soil conditioners. So, let us see. So, we have covered the soil tillage part, different types of tillages and then uh, you know con conventional tillage, conservation tillage, primary tillage, secondary tillage, their objectives, their, their problems and uh, we also covered the soil crusting. So, let us start another important aspect that is soil density. Now, there are two types of density we generally talk when we are talking about soil. The first one is called particle density and the second one is called the bulk density. Okay. So, let us start with the particle density. So, particle density or generally we term it as DP is defined as the mass per unit volume of soil solid. So, if a 1 cubic meter of soil solid is weighed 2.6 megagrams or uh, 1 you know 2.6 tons, the particle density is 2.6 megagram per cubic meter which can also be expressed at 2.6 gram per cubic centimeter. Generally, we express this uh, soil density in gram per cc. So, so 2.6 megagrams or 2.2 uh, 2.6 tons per uh, cubic meter is equivalent to 2.6 uh, gram per cc. So, particle density remember that it is essentially the same as the specific gravity of a solid substances and particle densities for most mineral soil vary between the narrow limits of 2.60 2.75 megagram per cubic meter or 2. Generally, we generally for sake of simplicity, we generally consider the an average value of 2.65 gram per cc as the uh, soil particle density. So, so, another important density is uh, bulk density and we generally term soil bulk density as uh, dB which is defined as the mass of a unit volume of a dry soil and these volume includes both solids and pores. As you know that soil contains both solids and pores. So, when we are talking about bulk density, we are we are measuring, we, we, are, we are considering the volume of both solids and pore. So, this is the difference between the bulk density and particle density. In case of particle density, we are only considering the volume of solid particles. However, in case of bulk density, we are considering the bulk volume that is the volume of solid plus volume of pores. So, the units are same as particle density generally we term generally expressed in terms of gram per cc, but the value of bulk density is changeable like particle density and the generally coding instrument are used to determine the soil bulk density. So, let us see how we generally measure soil bulk density. Now, another important thing I just mentioned that value of bulk density can be changed. However, particle density is more or less constant. So, we will see some example later on. So, how we determine soil bulk density? Generally, we use some cylindrical core uh, for determining the soil bulk density and as you can see this is a cylindrical core. I have shown here some pictures. This is a cylindrical core and uh, which has got a fixed uh, you know volume. So, the sampler head contains an inner cylinder, this is the inner cylinder and uh, which is basically driven into the soil blows from the top of the hammer. So, we generally give blows uh, from the top with the help of a hammer and the inner core contains an undisturbed soil course. So, th the inner core contains an undisturbed soil course and um, generally we trimmed uh, on the edge of the knife. So, after we take out the soil, we generally trim the edge of the soil and the volume can easily can be calculated from the length of the diameter. So, we know its length, we know its diameter. 
so from that we can easily calculate its uh, volume and uh, obviously the weight of the soil can be calculated after drying it at 105 degree centigrade for 24 hours so <coughs> this is how we calculate the soil bulk density so calculation formula of soil bulk density i have discussed uh, in the next slide so let us see so let us first consider particle density so if you consider four blocks of solid rocks where there is no pore space obviously the total volume will be 4 multiplied by 2 cm into 1 cm 1 cm so the total volume should be 8 cubic cm however the weight the cumulative weight for all the four blocks is 21.6 gram so particle density is basically the total weight by the volume of solid so it gives us 2.7 gram per cubic centimeter so this is a particle density obviously it is a prismatic solid mass consists of four tightly fitted mineral blocks where there is no pore space it is important now in case of bulk density consider the same four blocks of solid rock arranged loosely to form a cylinder of soil so you can see this is a cylinder of soil and in this cylinder of a soil all these four blocks are arranged together so that it includes the space between the mineral blocks also so you can see these are the space between the mineral blocks so the total volume of the cylindrical soil um, uh, cylindrical soil is basically pi r square h so you can calculate is ultimately 17.7 .7 cubic centimeter and weight is same obviously 21.6 gram because pore space doesn't contain any weight obviously bulk density is 1.22 gram per cc so you can see this cylindrical pore there are 45 percent solid and 55 percent of pore space and as we know uh, these 2.5 centimeter their length and 3 centimeter diameter as we can see from the last slide the we know that uh, cylindrical core length and diameter so we can easily calculate this so once we calculate this we just have to calculate the weight of the soil and from there we can calculate the bulk density obviously uh, you know in this case the it is a dry bulk density because we are drying the soil we are taking the weight of a dry soil so uh, here also you can see in the field one cubic meter of a certain soil appear as 1.33 megagram or tons solids and pore space so in the field one cubic meter of certain soil appeared as 1.33 megagram so to calculate the bulk density of the soil you see volume is basically one cubic meter which contains both solid and pores because this contains some pores also weight is 1.33 megagrams bulk density weight of oven dry soil and volume of soil that is contains solid plus pores so therefore bulk density we are getting 1.33 by 1 that is 1.33 megagram per cubic meter so if all the solids could be compressed to the bottom the cube would look like this so you can see we are compressing the soil we are uh, you know half of the pore space and half of the solids so solid will still contain uh, st still weigh 1.33 uh, megagrams and to calculate the soil particle density we are getting volume right now 0.5 cubic meter weight is the same one point weight is the same 1.33 megagrams so soil particle density is volume weight of soil weight of solids and volume of the solids so we are getting 2.66 megagram per meter cube or 2.66 gram per cc so i hope that uh, now it is clear how we calculate soil uh, particle density and soil bulk density and uh, these are very much important uh, uh, these are very much important soil physical parameters or uh, physical properties which has different connotation with uh, soil physiochemical conditions and favorable soil physiochemical conditions. So uh, let us wrap up here and in the next lecture we will start from the next slide. Thank you very much.